And joining us now is Dr. Artika Tyner. She is the founding director of the Center on Race, Leadership and Social Justice at the University of St. Thomas School of Law. Dr. Tyner, thank you so much for joining us today. First, uh, give me your thoughts on the first couple of weeks of the Chauvin trial. Well, I think the thoughts definitely, it's been a, a challenge, of course. We've seen the news media coverage of Mr. Floyd's family, um, watching the videos, watching the court hearings and, and being there in, in person in the family watching room. So we definitely want to make sure that we send them our um, positive energy and our hope and support. But I would say more broadly, we definitely see the challenges that the community feels they face time and time again. The idea that on justice now is not just Mr. Chauvin, but their own experience with policing and how that's influenced, especially for communities of color around their racial identity. Now, the first uh, week of the trial, it was filled with uh, some pretty gripping testimony here. Let's take a listen to some of what was said and then I'll get your thoughts on the other side. It's been nice. I stayed up apologizing and, and apologizing to George Floyd for not doing more. Disbelief and guilt. Why guilt? Um, if I would have just not taken the bill, this could have been avoided. When he kept saying I can't breathe, and when he said, Mama, they're killing me. And they're killing me. That's what I kept saying. I can't breathe. Mama, they're killing me. So tell me about the emotion that stirs up, especially among the African American community. I think it's the emotion, as you heard Ms. Frazier talk about, feeling that uh, she owed Mr. Floyd an, an apology. This is not, I think oftentimes we jump to the summer of 2020 and the tragic murder of Mr. Floyd. This is centuries in the making of the, for the African-American community, a feeling that structural racism has, for many, made it impossible to realize pieces of the American dream or even the basics of having their civil and human rights protected so as we watch, whether it's the eyewitnesses that are on the stand or the community members watching from their home, in many ways, it feels like those shattered dreams that Langston Hughes talked about or what happens in his poem in A Raisin and Sun. You see something fettering, something just very deep of a frustration. Hence why you saw across the nation, across the world, demands and demands for change around policing, demands for change around the justice system because millions of folks felt they could no longer be silent, that this was an opportunity for their voices to be heard. So, you know, as a human being watching George Floyd dying is you know, pretty emotional, but as a black man in America, it stirs up more troubling feelings here. What effect is the replaying of these images during the, the trial um, having on African-Americans that you've heard? Well, if we look at the research from Boston University, it shows that for each of the police killings that we see, of whether it's deadly force in a myriad of different ways of an officer shooting or this neck restraint that was used against Mr. Floyd, we know that if we can assess it, that that equates to over 55 million mental health days. So the mental health toll, the trauma of seeing time and time again, these videos and whether it's on the news or watching it as you're watching the trial, reliving it, so, and then it's exacerbated for those who actually saw it and witnessed it the first time and felt that they were powerless, not just against Officer Chauvin, but a whole system in many ways that they feel that may not protect them in their greatest time of need. Speaking of and what, for me personally, go ahead, go ahead, I'm sorry. I didn't mean I was anymore. going to say just, just personally as well, as an African-American female, you're not just seeing Mr. Floyd, you're seeing your uncle, your brother, or your father. It's something that's more personal to you. And, and I want to go to this. You spoke about watching the trial just a moment ago. The trial originally was not supposed to even be broadcast, but the judge uh, changed that. We saw George Floyd die on camera. So no matter what happens in court, why is it important that the world be able to see and watch the trial play out? The world needs to see that there are four centuries playing out here. Four centuries of a struggle for African-Americans to realize the promise of justice and freedom in some meaningful ways that all of a sudden that video that they watch as the world watches on, they see judge, jury, and everything happening all at once 
as Mr. Chauvin, Officer Chauvin, is pressing his knee against the neck of an unarmed, handcuffed gentleman who is praying and calling out for his mother, pleading that he cannot breathe. And I think an important testimony that we heard this week was from Chief Arredondo that let us know that this was not policy, that in fact, the policy focuses on de-escalation and around something that I think is very basic to our identity here in America, the sanctity of life and the protection and the importance of protecting life. All right, Dr. Artika Tyner with the University of St. Thomas School of Law Center on Race, Leadership and Social Justice. Thank you so much for your time this afternoon. Thank you. Now you can watch the Derek Chauvin murder trial live every day that court is in session. We're streaming it on KTVU.com and the KTVU mobile app.